God, we thank you for your spirit. We welcome you into this place. Move and have your way, God. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord oh Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and feel the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence There's nothing worth more There's nothing worth that more. could ever come close. Ever come close. Nothing can compare. Nothing can compare. You are our living hope. Oh, 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 your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of love, where my heart becomes free, and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, oh Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and. Feel the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place. Come flood this place and feel the atmosphere. I want your glory, Lord. Your glory. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Oh, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Hey, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience, let us experience the glory, the glory of, your goodness. of your goodness. Let us become let us Become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience your glory. Shower your spirit. Let us become more aware of your presence. The glory, the glory, the glory, the glory, the glory, the glory. 
come to give God glory, to praise His holy name because He's worthy. I know you agree that He's worthy. God has been faithful. God has been kind. God has been faithful to us. He's kept us through all of this and He keeps on keeping us. My God reigns. My God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Lord, you reign above every name. Yes. My God reigns. My God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Lord, you reign above every name. With power and majesty. Power and majesty. Dominion authority. authority. You reign. You reign.
Emmaus, Emmaus, Emmaus. I am interrupting our regularly scheduled broadcast to say just a few words, and these are they. What the heaven? These last few days, these last few weeks have become absolutely indescribable. For many of us, for some of us, for one of us, we can hardly catch our breath as soon as we reconcile, try to figure out how to respond to one tragedy, there's another. And so I just wanted to pause to let you know that I am a living Romans chapter 15, I think it's 13, it says this, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep or mourn with those who weep or mourn. My emotions are all over the place as I read the news and simply try to take in what is happening. On the one hand, I see vaccines being snatched from shelves and I have to wonder and pray for and cry out and lament for those who have that particular strand of the vaccine, and those who are were hurting and wondering what might happen. I lift up your hearts and your hopes and your fears. I have to wonder about the delay of inoculation of other people and what that means for the safety of the masses and for those who've already taken it. Lord, hear our prayer. And then as I try to watch the news, I have to turn it off because as I'm reeling, watching through a trial where the murder of a man is up for discussion, God rest the soul of George Floyd, is interrupted by another killing in greater Minneapolis. And so, Lord, we call out the name of Dante Wright and we send love to his family. But right now, Lord God, we saying, what the heaven, what is going on? Lord God, we don't know what to do. We're not sure how to respond, Lord God, hear our prayer. We sing like the psalmist, how long, O oh Lord, how long? And as if that is not enough and our hearts are not harried and worried there, we who are in the city of greater Chicago have had given witness to yet another shooting, another murder by a police officer of a 13-year-old boy with his hands up. Lord God, how long, Adam Toledo, we have failed you. So I don't have answers, beloved, but I just wanted to mark the moment and save space for the question, for the lament, for the cry, for the uncertainty, for the fear, for the anger. Lord, hear our prayer. When I was growing up and there was a death in the neighborhood or there was a tragedy in the land, we literally would pause, stop, wait, because something has happened. And so in that tradition of my childhood and the tradition of my foremothers and forefathers of the Jewish faith who literally sat with things and people who had passed away, they sat in the parlor and waited quietly. And so this today, my friends and family, is an invitation just to create space to be present to wherever and however we feel. Refuse to allow others to judge where you are and what triggers have come. I sit in silence, remember the lives of those prematurely taken by violence, force, ignorance, and arrogance. Lord, hear our prayer. I trust and hope in the God who is with us as we weep. I remember the words of the psalmist who says this, that God is the one who collects and honors all of our tears. So right now, I simply authorize the weeping. I know that hope will return because the scripture says it will. But in the meantime, we weep, we cry out, and then we will respond. 
Hang in there. I love you to life. God is with us in our pain and in our sorrow, never to leave us. Amen.
Everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It is springtime. So let's spring up for some Sunday worship. Come on with me. On my name is Stacy Howard Hopkins, and on behalf of the Reverend Dr. Elise D. Barrymore and our entire Emmaus leadership team, home team, cyber team, we say welcome to yet another epic, epic Emmaus gathering here on Sunday, April the 18th, 2021. Good to see you, even if it is virtual. Love and miss you, and I promise we will be back together soon, as soon as the Lord and the powers that be deem it safe and appropriate. Until then, cyber hugs. Love you. And now, here are your Emmaus community announcements. Please be sure to join our daily prayer line Monday through Saturday mornings. We are having prayers inspired by the book, Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. Please refer to the EmmausCommunity.org for details. Thursday afternoon Bible and brunch and Thursday evening exploration are back. During Bible and brunch, we will be studying the book of Jonah and during Thursday night exploration, we will have discussions inspired by episodes of The Simpsons do not miss the fun. You can find call-in details on the EmmausCommunity.org website or our weekly email blast. See you there. Remember, as always, the EmmausCommunity.org website is your go-to place for information regarding our affinity groups and children's programming. Please use this resource to gather detailed information for you or your children's participation. Here at the Emmaus Community, we strive to become a generous community of faith. We tithe and give offerings as an act of worship and as a reflection of God's love and mercy towards us. As a global ministry, we serve both our global and local communities. We are called to care and nurture life, to feed the hungry, protect the oppressed and marginalized, and befriend the distant, disconnected, and disenfranchised. Please partner with us to serve God's people. You may mail your tithes and offerings to the Emmaus Community, 20820 Western Avenue, Olympia Fields, 60461. You may also use the GiveLify app on your mobile device. Dear Heavenly Father, it is us again. Thank you so much, Lord God, for all that you continue to do during this pandemonium, this pandemic, this coronation. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are still here and we are still willing and able to serve you. Thank you for all that you provide for us. Thank you for all the resources in the storehouse. Thank you for springtime. Thank you that the sun shines, that the rain comes and waters all of our, our plants and flowers and trees we, and our crops. We thank you that we, even though we are physically distant, we are spiritually intact and spiritually close, not only amongst each other, but continually with you. We ask that you please bless, please bless our offering and our tithes and all the resources that we have in our community so that we can go out and be your community, that we can go out and continue to be the church, continue to be the worshipers, continue to be the leaders and the beacons that you would have us to be, Father. We ask at this time that you continue to just bless everyone here everyone near, everyone far. Bless those with a heart and the resources and the mind to give and bless those who are making their way to be that father. We ask all of these things in your name. Amen. 
Hello, Emea's family and friends. I'm Ken Battle, and I've been blessed with today's opportunity to present the prayers of the people. As I began to prepare for this opportunity, I couldn't help but to reflect on the past couple of months and some significant actions that took place. As some of y'all are aware, I had a total knee replacement on March 24th. Going into this surgery, of course, I was counseled by many regarding the side effects, the challenges, and the possible negative consequences of the surgery. Some of these conversations caused me to begin to question my faith in this operation. Fortunately, though, I was prayed over and for by several from the mayor's family. These prayers helped me to solidify my faith in God knowing he remains in control of all outcomes. Another significant moment for me was waking up on Easter Sunday and having the opportunity once again to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, year after year, I struggled with the idea that some folks really participated in the crucifixion of Jesus based on the perception and accusations of others. Although we know Jesus was well aware of his fate, I believe he too had a moment when his faith was challenged. The book of Mark, chapter 15, verse 34, in the NIV, says it this way. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi, Lima Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Thankfully, though, for us, Jesus completed this prophecy and put his trust in Father God for our salvation. Daily, we continue to witness events that could easily lead us to question our faith and what we believe to be fair and true. People of color continue to fall victim to others who believe they are superior, and then we are forced to justify our rights for fairness. Children are being shot, accidentally and intentionally, for actions well beyond their control. Again, we have to lean into trust in God for comfort and clarity. So as we take a moment to reflect and say the names of those we would like to receive favor through our prayers, including ourselves, please know that as we keep our faith in Jesus Christ, as he did in his Father God, The answers to our prayers will come with the comfort that God is still in control. Please state your names. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today humble and thankful as we can possibly present ourselves to you, Father God. We come to you today, Father, asking that you would hear all those names that have been lifted up, Father. Those names that need comfort. Those names that need strength. Those names that just need a, a urging to keep moving ahead, Father. As we continue to struggle in this daily pandemic. As we continue to struggle with these daily actions. Father, we just ask you to continue to strengthen us, Father. As we, some of us are losing loved ones, Father. We ask that you would strengthen us. Strengthen those, Father. Hold them close to your bosom. Let them know, Father, that their comfort lies in you, Father God. We ask you today, Father, just once and again, just hear those names, Father. Take them in your hand, Father, and put a special prayer on top of it, Father. As we close, Father, I'd like to share this verse in hopes that it keeps us inspired. It comes from 2 Corinthians, verse 5, chapter 7, from the NIV, and it reads as follows. For we live by faith, not by sight. And all together we say, Lord, hear our prayer. What an awesome God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. He is the greatest in all the earth. He is our champion. Do you remember it? Come on and sing along with us. Our God is the awesome God. Our God is the awesome God. There is none like Him. There is none like Him. With Him we win. He is our 
I continue to praise God for each and every opportunity that we get to gather virtually, and I continue to praise God for opportunities where we can see each other in person. I am still absolutely celebrating the Easter drive through event where I had an opportunity to wave at you, to say hi to you, to pray for you, and to celebrate with you. And I'm looking forward to more opportunities for us to do those kinds of things as we make our way back into the sanctuary in a very strategic, significant significant and slow kind of way. Today, I continue to celebrate our 15-year anniversary, and today's guest preacher is none other than the friend of my heart and the friend of this house, the Reverend Dr. Pastor Daniel Hill. For you all who have been riding with us for a moment, we know that Pastor Daniel has been at Emmaus more than a few times. He literally is a friend of the house. But for those who don't know Pastor Daniel, Pastor Daniel is a pastor here in Chicago, greater Chicagoland in Humboldt Park at the River City. City Community Church. He um, is the founder and the pastor, and they were established about three years before Emmaus in 2003. Pastor Daniel is an author uh, more than a few times over, but Wide Awake, White Lies, and his a book on 1010 Living, and I'm so grateful for that. Uh, what it's called 1010 Life to the Fullest. And so I'm so grateful that he is not just author, but he is profound thinker, he is a thought catalyst, and he is a pastor extraordinaire. The Bible tells us that if you want to have a friend, you must first show yourself friendly. And so I thank God that God allowed our hearts and our minds to hook up, and I saying blessings to him and to the River City Church. We have an opportunity to be together in worship and praise. I send love and greetings to his wife, Elizabeth, who is a professor of psychology, and to his two kids, Xander and Gabriella. We love you to life. Today, I thank God for Pastor Daddy, who is bringing the word of God to us with simplicity, clarity, and power. Receive ye him in the name of God the Creator, Jesus Christ our risen Savior, and the Holy Spirit, the one who gives us strength to love and to live. Receive the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, Amaze community. Uh, I cannot tell you how honored I am, how happy I am to be with you. As you can see, I'm coming from your sister church, River City Community Church here in the uh, West Humble Park neighborhood of Chicago, and we have been connected deeply to you ever since you guys have started. Ever since, you know, we're, we're right around the same age, uh, so we're always so thankful for you. You all have been such a blessing every year in so many ways, but every year at Thanksgiving, y'all uh, bring a hundred turkeys down and donate that to the school across the street from us. Um, so, so thankful for you, and I have always loved your community. Um, I've been attending services. Um, whenever I was able to since very early on in Amaze's history and uh, um, so many things that I have always loved about it. I remember the first time I was at a service and uh, rousing praise and worship and such a great time. And then all of a sudden y'all pause and uh, uh, somebody said, you know, now go up and fellowship and get coffee at the coffee bar. And I was like, what is happening here? This is unbelievable. Uh, and then a little bit later on, uh, we were there um, with some of our staff and we all saw you all do the prayer and praise time that you do. And um, I don't know if you were still doing this up into the COVID time, but uh, when we were there during prayer and praise, you would uh, do shout outs for birthdays and uh, not only celebrate if it was somebody's birthday, but you'd invite them to get up and dance. And uh, that left an indelible mark on us. We, the very next week started doing that same thing at River City and have been copying it ever since. Although, a lot of the white folks don't like to dance in the moment, so we're not quite as, we don't have quite as much flair as you do with it, but uh, you have shaped us in so many different ways. So I love your church. I'm thankful to be with you. It's such an important time coming out of the series you just finished and um, into this special time of reflection and celebration. Uh, I also love Pastor Elise, Dr. Pastor Elise so much. Um, she is a brilliant woman. Uh, she's a resilient woman. She is a loving woman. You know, to tell some, tell y'all something that you know already, um, many way too painfully, but it is not easy being a woman in this world. It is definitely not easy being a black woman in this world. And it is not easy being a woman or black in the church world. And for uh, Pastor Elise now, 25 years, uh, having been ordained, and you all coming up on 15 year anniversary for Emmaus, mm, uh, what, a, what a special, thing for me to treasure to be with y'all in and I want to celebrate her and celebrate you all and I'm honored to be able to um, share a word with you uh, at this important time of reflection and celebration. 
So as I was kind of meditating on asking God to kind of guide my thoughts as to how to step into this moment with you all, um, I kept feeling myself drawn back to the book of Hebrews, a book I've been studying a lot lately. And uh, Hebrews is a fascinating book. Um, I've really come to appreciate it deeply. And uh, some interesting things about it, it's the only book in the New Testament we don't know uh, with confidence who the author is. But even though we don't know the name of the author, we know a whole lot about the author. And that helps shape some of uh, why I'm drawn to this book and to this passage for this day. Uh, some of the things that we know about this author of the book of Hebrews, the, the author of the book of Hebrews, super, super smart. Uh, um, scholars, commentators, as they study this book, just uh, just repeatedly kind of acknowledge just the intelligence, uh, the, the uh, capacity that the writer of Hebrews had to organize thoughts and communicate deep theology. Uh, second thing we know about the writer of Hebrews is that the writer of Hebrews knew the Old Testament inside and out. The writer of Hebrews was fascinated with what we would now call the Old Testament at that time, which is called the Hebrew Scriptures. And uh, the whole point that the writer of Hebrews wants to make throughout the book is to show how everything in the Old Testament was pointing to the person of Jesus. How in the words of uh, New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, that Jesus is the final chapter of the story. That the Old Testament, a very important story, telling us all about the nature of who God is, but that the story is fulfilled and completed in the person of Jesus Christ. And the last thing, it's always helpful for me to know a book, because even though we're going to look at one passage, it's helpful for me to know the uh, full spectrum of what the writer is bringing. The third thing we know about the writer of Hebrews that's really relevant is that the writer of Hebrews is particularly pastoral. That even though the writer is very brilliant and wants to make some points about the way the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus, it's all done in a very pastoral way. In fact, many commentators believe that really the book of Hebrews is different than in the other New Testament letters and that it's not really a letter. It really reads much more like a sermon. And it's a sermon of comfort and a sermon of care. Uh, when the writer of Hebrews is writing this to Hebrew people, which is where it gets its name, to Jews who have put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, uh, they're experiencing suffering, adversity, persecution. Uh, they were shaken to the core, to the point where many were considering giving up their faith. And so when the writer of Hebrews is talking about Jesus, um, it's not some esoteric exercise thinking about abstract theology. Not that I'm saying even thinking about theology in that way is bad, but that's not the point of Hebrews. The point of Hebrews is to meet real people in a real place who have real needs and to show them how Jesus is the answer to um, all the questions that they have, that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that they've been searching for, what they're considering. All right, well, how does that connect to your story here at Emmaus? How does that connect to this moment I'm meeting you in where you're um, coming out of this big series, you're about to celebrate 15 years, Pastor Elise, uh, 25 years of being ordained. Well, the whole thrust, as I mentioned, of the book of Hebrews is the centrality of Jesus. And in fact, I'm not going to cover verses 1 and 2, but if you want to know the whole of Hebrews, you can actually, it's unlike, this is again, I said it's more like a sermon than a letter. Most letters have these kind of lengthy introductions at the beginning. The writer of Hebrews summarizes the whole book in the first three verses. You can get the sense of what the whole book is going to be about in the first three verses. Uh, but in verse 2, the writer of Hebrews says that when God spoke, it sounded like Jesus. That Jesus is the ultimate revelation of the person of God. The writer of Hebrews says in that same verse that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. That the fullness of God's glory can be seen in the person of Jesus. Same verse, the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. Any one of those, I could have happily done a sermon. I mean, to think about the exact representation of God's being. In other words, the mysterious, infinite, eternal qualities of God. Qualities that we would assume we probably could never wrap our heads around. The writer of Hebrews says, everything that's true about God can be seen in the person of Jesus. What God looks like in the infinite can be seen in the finite expression of the person of Jesus. So this is what the writer of Hebrews is going to develop all throughout the book. Jesus is the central focal point of everything. And it culminates beautifully in the passage we're going to read in Hebrews chapter 12. The, there's chapter after chapter, 1 through 11, building on this theme of Jesus at the center of everything. And then famously, as we'll read in just a moment, the writer of Hebrews says, So therefore, fix your eyes on Jesus. 
fix your eyes on Jesus, the author, the pioneer, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. And this is where I see this so connected to the journey of Emmaus. Um, this is what you this is what you all have 15 years of doing of history of doing. This is your testimony of trying to help people fix their eyes on Jesus. And y'all love helping seasoned, mature saints fix their eyes on Jesus. But you always have always had a heart for those on the outside, those who um, feel alienated from the church, uh, who can't do church the way they had done it growing up, who have felt uh, a sense of disconnection with Jesus and purpose in life. And you all have always been motivated to create a space, a safe space, a sacred space, a holy space, an exuberant space, an enthusiastic space, a life-giving space that helps people encounter the almighty living God and to fix their eyes on Jesus. And so I'd love to read with you this brief but very robust, very full uh, teaching from Hebrews chapter 12, where the writer of Hebrews famously talks about this. Uh, but is, in a sense, culminating 11 full chapters when the writer says this. So let's read this. It's just, it's just uh, really just two verses I want to read. And yet there's so much content in these, these two verses. So this is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So if you all are still opening your Bibles, and even if you want to stand up and honor the word, whatever you want to do in the space you're in right now, but let me read out of this. I'll be reading out of the NIV. This is how the writer of Hebrews says it in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. This is the word of God. Well, what I'd love to do, I don't want to try to get fancy at all here. I just want to follow the word as it is delivered here in Hebrews chapter 12 and, and pass on uh, some ways to celebrate who you've been up to this point. And uh, specifically to think of some encouragement, some admonitions for the amazed community, for certainly for yourself as individuals. I hope this encourages you in your walk. But for sure, you know, most of these letters are written to communities. We're to think of our individual application out of the larger theme of what the Bible is telling us as a community to do. So I'll particularly focus on the encouragements to a community and then how that inf influence in can impact you as an individual. So let's just kind of make our way through these couple of verses. Right after Hebrews starts by saying, Therefore, one of the only things I actually remember from seminary is this axiom that I've always found to be helpful. One of my professors used to say, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, ask what it is there for. Right? It reminds us that we're never reading in isolation, that it's part of a larger theme. And so, as I mentioned earlier, for 11 chapters, the writer of Hebrews has been talking about Jesus at the center of all of existence. And so the writer, the writer is saying, therefore, based on 11 chapters worth exploring, Jesus as the definitive word of God, the definitive revelation of God, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. The writer of Hebrews is finishing up the thoughts now by saying, therefore, and here's the first encouragement, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. All right, as you're celebrating where you've come from over 15 years, as you look forward to where God has continued to take you, I want to encourage you that there is a cloud of witnesses that is cheering you on. One of the reasons I'm so happy to be doing this myself is to remind you that there's a cloud of witnesses here and now in your own city, in your own extended area that's cheering you on. And I hope that's meaningful to you. What the writer of Hebrews is reminding us is that this cloud of witnesses that's cheering you on, this goes all the way back to the beginning chapters, the beginning of the story of the Old Testament, the Bible. Right? The writer of Hebrews wants you to know that Moses is part of the cloud of witnesses cheering you on, Amaz. That King David is part of that cloud of witnesses cheering you on. That Queen Esther is part of that cloud of witnesses cheering you on. In fact, just one chapter earlier, in chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews goes through great length to name some specifically and then to begin to group some folks 
to show you just how far and how wide the cloud of witnesses is that's encouraging. I think it's important to remember that, that our communities are not living in isolation. I do think each of our communities has its own purpose, its own destiny, its own uh, part of the story that we're supposed to play. But it's never done in isolation. We're all part of this larger body. We've got this cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on. And I hope that encourages you that you literally have a cloud of witnesses that's cheering you on for these next 15 years to create these spaces that can help people meet the almighty living God and to fix their eyes on Jesus. So that's our first encouragement. Let's just keep moving right through the text. Second encouragement. The writer of Hebrews says, throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. Now, many of you grew up in church environments. I know many of you there, and I know this has just been the story of Emmaus. A lot of you um, trying to find a more life-giving and loving expression of church than perhaps what you've experienced growing up. And some of you grew up in environments where when sin came up, it's just like this, ugh, this dreary topic. It's just always part of a hell and fire and brimstone God. It's about behavior management. It's about living your holy life and um, not making mistakes so that you're not breaking fellowship with God. But you all know this now. You're under great teaching. You know, that's not the spirit of what the Bible talks about. When it's talking about sin, it's not about following you around and seeing if you broke the rules or not so that God can give you an A or an F or something in between so that God can punish you or uh, do some kind of a karma thing where you're receiving bad signals or bad things happening to you. Now, that's just none, none of that. That's not how God works. God wants you to be delivered from sin because sin gets in the way of what God intends for you. I think it's so interesting that in this beautiful passage about faith, about life-giving faith that's tied to fixing your eyes on Jesus, that the writer says, you have power here. Uh, you shouldn't want to have sins that are holding you back. You shouldn't want things that are hindering you from living the life God has intended for you, right? So we need to throw those things off. We need to throw those things off so that we can be all that God has intended for us to be, so that you can step into the life that God has created you to live. That is part of fixing your eyes on Jesus. When you're fixing your eyes on Jesus and moving forward, you are, by definition, leaving some things behind. Right? So don't think of this as some kind of a fire and brimstone God. Don't think of this as behavior management. Think of this as a God who wants you to participate in the love of God in the fullest way possible. A God who wants you to be whole and healed. A God that wants you to be filled with the love that reminds you that you are indeed God's beloved and that that is the central identity of who you are. That is, that as Paul says in Ephesians 2, you've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You're God's craftsmanship, God's workmanship. And so there's this, I, I appreciate it. It's real talk. It's saying, look, if you're going to fix your eyes on Jesus and experience all that Jesus has for you as a community, as individuals, you got to leave that stuff behind that entangles you, that hinders you from stepping into the life that God has called you to. Third encouragement. The writer of Hebrews says, run with perseverance, the race marked out for continuing on this theme, reminding us that your faith journey isn't just about getting the answers right or knowing all the right doctrines. It's about participating with Jesus in such a manner that you're completing the race that God has for you. And this is, again, where it feels just like very real talk from the writer of Hebrews. Remember, I said this: the, the, the writer of Hebrews is pastoral. The writer of Hebrews wants to encourage people. And the writer of Hebrews says, run your race. Yes, run your race. Do it with perseverance. When is it that you need to persevere? What part of the race is it where perseverance is required? It's not the starting point, nor is it when you're just about to cross the finish line. When is perseverance needed? Perseverance is needed when you hit those hard stretches, when the race gets challenging, when your body starts to hurt, when you wonder if you've really got what it takes to continue on. 
Now, I think this word is applicable in a lot of different seasons, but let's be honest. We, we're uh, what are we now? 14 months into COVID right now. COVID has kicked our butts like few things ever have. Right, the level of psychological uh, fatigue from living in this, the level of social isolation from being physically disconnected from people, being on a thousand Zoom meetings, uh, being stuck inside during one of the coldest winters we've ever had, having to do it against a backdrop in which it started with George Floyd, <laughs> more recently with Brother Dante, the, the the level of racism and white supremacy and where the whole world has stopped and just had to sit with this spiritually, emotionally, socially, COVID has been devastating. And we're not all the way out of it quite yet. I think some of us, this could just be the word we need today. We need to remember that there's some points where perseverance is what's needed. I was talking to a friend just today, actually, who's going through a really, really difficult season. And we prayed at the end. And one of the things we prayed, you know, there are some seasons of life where it's exciting and there's movement. It feels like God is just opening doors for you. And we should cherish and celebrate those seasons when they happen. Some seasons, it feels like just hanging on is victory in and of itself. To just hang on, to persevere, to just... Make it another day to put one foot in front of the other. That in itself is victory in that season. That's the third encouragement that the writer of Hebrews gives us. To run with perseverance, the race marked out for you. That's true for you individually, but Emmaus, God has got a race marked out for you. Run it with perseverance. Do another 15 and another 15 after that. Let us continue to push forward into what God has called us. Encouragement four, fix your eyes on Jesus. This is what it's all driving for, towards. Fix your eyes on Jesus. The in NIV says, uh, pioneer and perfecter of your faith. And I want to say a little bit on each one of those words, because this is one of the most famous verses in the book of Hebrews, and rightfully so. It is a beautiful depiction of who Jesus is. Um, an author, it's often translated, or a pioneer. That's the same word, the Greek word, archegos. And then perfecter or finisher, depending on which translation that you are reading. Let's start with that first one. Again, archegos, this word that was very common in the Greek language back then. Uh, sometimes it was used for an author. Sometimes it was used for a pioneer. I think they're essentially getting to the same idea. But I think it's fun to take the two English translations and think about them separately. Because it highlights a slightly different way in which Jesus shows up in our life. So let's start with author. Let's take a moment to think of not only fixing our eyes on Jesus, but fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author of our faith. Now, one of the reasons I like thinking about author here is that you don't have to have a seminary degree to think about what an author is, right? Uh, all of us have experienced at some point or another the beauty, the movement of being swept up by a story that is so well written, right? To read a book by an author that is well written and, you know, if we're attention starved, maybe it's a movie, but, you know, it's the same idea of an author. But somebody who writes a story, you get swept into this. It becomes almost a transcendent feeling to go through the ups and the downs, the triumphs and the defeats, the connections, the, the, the meaning of the story. And what a fun way, I think it's fun at least, to think of how we're to fix our eyes on Jesus by considering him as the author of our story. Right? Consider this for yourself individually. Consider this for the story of Emmaus, the journey that God has got you on. That Jesus is the author of this faith story. Said another way, when you celebrate these 15 years of legacy that you have now, when you look forward to what God will continue to do, remember that your role as a church is not to tell a new story, but to help people discover the story of Jesus, to find their place, and we all have a place in the story of Jesus, to help us see the mystery, the intrigue, the beauty, the adventure, the life that comes with being in the story of Jesus. 
and remembering that this is why surrender is so important, right? You don't pick up a story by a great author and say, eh, I don't like this story so far. I'm going to close the book and rewrite it myself. It's just not, it's not the way our stories work, right? Only one person gets to be the author, either the author of the story or you. And the same is true in our walk with Jesus. The same is true for you, Emmaus. It's not your story that you're writing ultimately. It is Jesus' story. And we are surrendering to him. That is when we come most fully alive. That is when uh, our potentiality, all that God has created us to be as a community, comes to full fruition when we have surrendered ourselves to Jesus, the author of our faith story. Archegos is just as frequently translated pioneer as it is here in NIV. And it's the same essential idea, but it gets to a little bit of a different feel when you reflect on that one. So let's spend just a minute on pioneer. What is a pioneer? Well, a pioneer is somebody who is going out presumably into a hard to navigate area, possibly even a dangerous area, and is going to lead the way for us, go before us. Uh, I've got two kids at home. Uh, Xander's 11, Gabby turns nine this month which is amazing because when I was going to Emmaus in the early days, I was kidless, which made it so much easier to get out there. And so here we are now. I've got an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old. But the last thing we did before our first kid came was took a vacation. My wife and I, Liz, took a vacation and uh, went to Brazil, uh, without question, one of my favorite places I've ever been. And we started in the, uh, in the jungle area um, on the Amazon River. We uh, uh, stayed in these huts and got to see kind of untouched wildlife. It was really an amazing experience. And uh, just to make sure you didn't get yourself in too much trouble, they had a guide who was on site all the time. His name was Nelson. He was an unforgettable guy. Nelson was filled with life, exuberant, incredible conversationalist. Um, one of the highlights of the day, every day, would just be talking in and learning about it. Uh, as we got towards the end of this trip, Nelson said to us, um, and uh, one other couple that was staying in the hut next to us, he said, hey, do you guys want to go on the most amazing adventure? Yeah, we want to go on the most amazing adventure. He said, all right, it's a full day affair. So I need you to get some good rest. Meet me here in the morning. We are going to go on an adventure that you will not forget. And so I'm I'm temperamentally um, uh, drawn to adventures. So I had trouble sleeping. I couldn't wait to see what Nelson had in store for us. So uh, the four of us met up with Nelson that next morning. And I was ready for this big pep talk about how much fun we we're going to have. But Nelson actually got kind of serious. He said, now, I'm going to take you on a trip through the deepest parts of the Amazon jungle, and it's a very dangerous place. He said, you don't know what kind of wildlife you might see. You need to be aware of that. He said, there's all kind of poisonous plants, so you need to be aware of that. There's little sinkholes and places where you can fall off. That you need to be aware of that. So I need you to stay super, super close to me. It is dangerous in there. Listen, I looked at each other and thought, this is not the pep talk that we got yesterday. That is, suddenly does not sound all that fun. And Nelson looks so serious. But then he paused for a second. And then that huge trademark grin that everybody came to know him. He said, but if you'll follow me and if you'll trust me, you will have an adventure that you will never forget. So just stay close to me and you'll have stories to tell your kids for years and years to come. And then he turned around and got all Indiana Jones-like on us and pulled out this big machete and walked right to an area where it didn't even look like it was passable and started making his way through. And I found myself going, man, where's my Indiana Jones machete? I want to do this too. <laughs> and Liz and I and this other couple got behind him and we followed him. And for a whole day, we went through the ins and the outs of the Amazon jungle. And just as he said, it was an unforgettable experience. But I literally, I don't want to try to over-spiritualize myself. But it's not always that I'm thinking of a passage when I'm having an adventure. But on that day, I was picturing Hebrews 12 the whole way through. Because when Nelson moved, I knew I did not want to be far behind him. I didn't want to get ahead of him, but I also didn't want to be too far behind him. I wanted to be right on his heels. As he negotiated and moved his way through that jungle, I wanted to follow my pioneer to see what adventures he had in store. And that is the imagery of Hebrews 12. That is what I was thinking of, is Jesus as the pioneer of our faith. I've always pictured Nelson now when I think of this passage in Hebrews chapter 12. A Jesus that I don't want to be too far in front of, because what good is that? It's his story, not mine. But also, Jesus, I don't want to be too far behind. A Jesus that I want to be intimately connected to, following him closely, trusting him. It reminds me in John 10 when Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. The sheep know my voice. 
they can distinguish it from the voice of a thief. And then famously in John 10, 10, he says, it's my intention to give you life to the fullest, life in all abundance. But there is a thief. There's a thief that will steal and kill and destroy if you go off on your own. But like Nelson said to us, you don't have to worry, just stay close to me and there's not a thing to worry about. And when we stay close to Jesus, the pioneer of our faith, he protects us and leads us into the story that God has drawn up for us, helps us to live into these good works that we've been created in advance to do. So that would be my encouragement to you, Emmaus, that would be my charge to you, to celebrate the ways you have fixed your eyes on Jesus for 15 years now. To celebrate the ways you have fixed your eyes on the author of your story and you've surrendered and you've submitted yourself to his story. To the ways that you have followed the pioneer of your faith. And may you continue to do so. May you continue to surrender to his story, trusting that there is no better story in the universe than the one that God has written for you. And that you will follow him, the pioneer, not trying to get ahead of him, doing your own thing, not falling too far behind, but saying right on his heels, listening to his voice, following him. Remembering that he is indeed the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. That word perfecter, in English, it's a weird word because it sounds like an A-plus, an errorless experience. But the word in Greek, perfecter, is not like our English word perfect. Um, most commentators say the word that's used there much closer would be complete or whole. So said simply, if you want to be a whole being, give yourself to Jesus. If you want to be a whole community, give yourself to Jesus. When we try to live life independent apart from Jesus, we disintegrate, we become disconnected. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author of our faith, the pioneer of our faith, we experience this completion, this wholeness by the one who on the cross said, it is finished. The story is not finished. The story is just starting. What's finished is ever wondering again if you're forgiven. Wondering ever again if your sins have been atoned for. Wondering if you have meaning and purpose. Jesus says, on the cross, we just celebrated this with Lent and with Good Friday and with Easter, right? Jesus says, it is finished. You no longer have to wonder if you are worthy or beloved or forgiven. You belong to me now. I went to that cross. It was my joy to go to that cross, as the writer of Hebrews says. What joy could it be to go to a cross? Well, when freedom's on the other side for the ones he loves then it's joy. Jesus joyfully went to that cross so you will never have to, so that you can be free and alive and to give yourself fully to Jesus and his purposes. So I bless you, Emmaus, to continue to follow and to fix your eyes on the one who's the author and the perfecter, the finisher and the perfecter of our faith, the pioneer of our faith. I love you all. Cannot wait till we can all be together in person. I'll be in your services again, hugging you as soon as we can again. So many blessings to you. Cannot wait to see you again. You are loved.
are not surprised that Pastor Daniel preached the word of the Lord because he is a student of the book and he is a student of life. We praise God for his word that's gone forth with simplicity, with clarity, and with power. I praise God for his integrity and his transparency, and I invite you, man and woman, boy and girl, to receive the word of the Lord and then to respond to the word of the Lord. For some of us, that response is an immediate moment right now. We will and need to make a decision or a declaration to be a close friend, a follower of Jesus Christ. If you've never made that commitment and you're not sure about the journey of faith, I invite you today to ask God to reveal God's self to you in particular, authentic, and personal ways. And while you're doing the asking, it's always helpful for us to be in relationship with other people who've been around the things of God to help us discern the way and the will of God. If that's you, I ask that you would reach out to God through prayer and then let us know. If you are on Facebook Live, if you make a comment in the comments, section and let us know you're out there. We have prayer warriors, intercessors, and elders who'd love to have an opportunity to have a conversation with you about what it means to be a friend or follower of Christ. For others of us, when we hear the word of God, we need to step away for a moment, let it resonate in our spirits. So if that's what you need to do, I invite you this afternoon to take a few moments, minutes, to receive the word of the Lord and ask God through the power of the Holy Spirit what it means for you to take the next reasonable step in faith. Whether is to join the part of the community of faith. For some of us, it's a prayer of repentance because we recognize we've kind of gotten off track and we need to realign ourselves. For others, it's a choice to be even more formal in our commitment to God, to not only join the community of faith and make membership known, but maybe you want to be baptized as your confession of faith. If that's you in any other way, we'd love to journey with you. But whatever you do, don't just let the word of God go out there and say, oh, what a good word, what a powerful word respond actually do what god and the word says don't just be a hearer but be a doer of the word of god 
That's the invitation. And if you want to talk about this some more, or you have some questions about the sermon, I invite you to join me today immediately following the 9 o'clock broadcast on Facebook Live Talk Back. And you can talk to me and we can talk about it so that we might discern what our next steps might be. I love you all to life. I thank you so much for participating in worship. And I thank you so very kindly for your generous commitment of time, talent, and treasure. Because of your generosity, we continue to be able to do the work of the Lord in our community. Thank you, thank you, and see you soon. You are a light on a hill. Shine brightly in your homes, your places of work, and even when you don't think anyone is looking, even when you don't think you are worthy, you are taking the next step into a great journey. Invite your friends to go with you. Move onward and upward. Christ living in you is the hope of the world. There is no other plan. So go out and be who God is calling you to be. You are more ready than you realize. Amen and amen.